<clears throat> Lord Jesus, we've been following a series about learning about how to pray the prayer that you've taught us. And we pray, Lord, today that you would continue to speak to us. Help us, Lord, to pray in a way that is pleasing to you. And we ask, Lord, that all who hear these words today would be blessed. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I've got a new tablet today and my tripod doesn't fit. <laughs> That's why I'm up here today and it's all a little bit different. But um, we've had several talks over the last number of weeks about the petitions that are found in the Lord's Prayer. I think a lot about titles at times and uh, what it's about today is the model prayer. But I thought, that's not really a very exciting title, is it? The actual fact, if you put all the teachings into practice, what you will get is that you will never have unanswered prayer. Is that a better title? How never to have an unanswered prayer. That's what I want, do you? Hallelujah. And uh, the verse I'm taking is Matthew 6 and verse 9. This then is how you should pray. See, Jesus didn't just go away and leave us. He's actually given us the instructions, and if we follow them, we get the results. But we often don't know, what, and we do it our own way instead, don't we? Well, we're completing our study on the petitions that made up the Lord's Prayer that we've been looking at. For the prayer, as it came from the lips of Christ, ended with that petition, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The great doxology in the authorised version of the Bible, you'll find at the close of St. Matthew's account of the prayer, and which has become so familiar to us by its constant repetition in the public use of prayer formed no part of the original prayer at all. Did you know that? But must be regarded as a liturgical addition made by the church in later years. It's one thing in the great Greek manuscript and in some important versions has been quite probably omitted from our revised English Bible. The probability is, is the words, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. They were added to the prayer in its public recitations. Much is in the same way as we do by saying, Glory to the Father and to the Son. Do you remember we do that very often when we say the Psalms? It's not my intention, therefore, to make any comment upon the doxology with which in our daily use we end the prayer, but rather to call your attention for some thoughts on the prayer in general suggested by the study of this prayer which Jesus gave to his disciples in answer to their request that he would teach them how to pray. If you've got a father, what do fathers do? They teach their children. And our Lord is our father and he wants to teach us how to pray. First of all, let me say that I believe Jesus gave this prayer for his disciples for use. That is to say, he intended them, 
using the very form of words, the circumstances of its origin seem to place this beyond dispute. This is the record Luke gives in chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. This is what it says. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father. In face of those words, when you pray, say, there is in some Bible commentators have put it, no getting past the evident precept here delivered that we ought habitually to use these words. Then our Lord, someone will remark, sanctions the use of forms of prayer. I am here, I know, on the very edge of a question which is one of the most difficult to deal with and one on which free churchmen differ strongly amongst themselves. Discussions upon the use of liturgical forms in worship crop up periodically at various assemblies. But my experience of them is that they generate a good deal of heat without giving much light. In our congregational churches, free prayer is the general, almost invariable practice. Our forefathers were so shocked at the formalism of the liturgical worship of the established church that in the interest of true spiritual worship, they rejected forms altogether. Some even going to the lengths of objecting to the use of the Lord's Prayer in the public services of the sanctuary. Their dislike and distrust of forms we have to a large extent inherited. But the fact that many people are asking the question today whether our services would not be all the more helpful if a little more of liturgical element were imported into them. It's proof that there are those among us who think that our fathers in their revolt against formalism went to the opposite extreme. And by their complete rejection of forms, injured, injured themselves and impoverished the public worship of the sanctuary. Of course, formalism is fatal to true worship, but the use of forms is not formalism. Formalism is the abuse of forms, but the fact that forms get abused is no reason for discarding them altogether any more than the fact that liberty sometimes, and with some people, degenerates into licence is a reason why we should all deny our freedom. In fact, in certain, a, 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 a certain amount of form is necessary. As someone has put it, there may be occasionally form without life, but there can never be life without form. No one, of, no one, of course, proposes to do away with free prayer. The abolition of free prayer from our services would, I'm convinced, do irre 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 irreparable injury to the spiritual life of our free churches. Our freedom in prayer has been our glory and our proud privilege. And that freedom 
must be jealously guarded. But there are in our congregations men and women of different temperaments. There are those among us, and I'm speaking now out of experience I've gained during my years in ministry, who would find simple forms a help to them. And the question is whether the interests of a congregation as a whole would not be better met by an order of service which should combine free and liturgical prayer rather than by order which should confine itself rigidly to the one, to the utter exclusion of the other. Further into the question, I do not mean to enter. I still have achieved my object. If I brought to you, the, que the question is really one of Christian expediency. There is no question here of right or wrong about our perfect right to introduce forms. If we choose, there can be no doubt. But a thing may be lawful and yet not expedient. And that is the point we have to settle with reference to liturgical forms. Is it expedient to introduce them? Would they enrich our worship? Would they edify the worshipper? Would they help us to come with boldness to the throne of grace? If they would, then adopt them. But if they would tend to lead us to formalism, if their effect would, would, would be to make us say our prayers instead of praying, or if their introduction would create bitterness or breed dissension in the church, then better forever remain without them. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not feeling desperately well, so uh, Nick, could you yeah. come and finish reading this, please? I'm, some of you know I'm having chemotherapy at the moment. <clears throat> This form of prayer, however, stands quite apart from every other. It has a sacredness all of its own. It is the Lord's Prayer. With perfect appropriateness, this form finds a place in all our services. I welcome the public use of the Lord's Prayer for various reasons. First of all, it is the one perfect prayer. In its six brief petitions, it seems to include everybody and everything. Men are always partial and one-sided, and our human prayers are partial and one-sided also. They express the needs of some and not of others. But this brief prayer is like its author. It is complete. Jesus was the Son of Man, the universal man. Everybody finds his counterpart in Jesus, and the prayer he gave it is a universal prayer. It voices the cry of every heart and the need of every soul. Then I welcome the use of this prayer for its associations. What sacred associations cluster around it? It is sacred to us because of him who first gave it. This is our Lord's Prayer, his gift to the world. Then it is sacred to us because of the saints, apostles, prophets and martyrs who have used it. This prayer is a link that binds all the Christian centuries together. Peter and John and Paul and James used to kneel down and say, Our Father. These early Christian assemblies in the upper room in Jerusalem, in Lydia's house in Philippi, and the catacombs at Rome used the very words we repeat together just now. This prayer is an heirloom in the Christian family handed down from one generation to another and binding the whole world by chains of gold about the feet of God. Then for many of us, this has associations of a still tender kind. 
It comes to us burdened with memories of the past. It's reported Dr Guthrie, 1803 to 1873, the famous Scottish divine who was involved with the ragged, ragged schools, when he was lying on his deathbed, he often, used, he often used to ask the members of his family to sing him a child's hymn. Those childish hymns carried him, used to carry him back to the old home and the long ago. Vanished days came back again as he listened to the songs he learned first at his mother's knee. What those children hymns were to Dr Guthrie that this player is most of us. It is the prayer in which we learned our first lessons of Christian truth. The first words were taught to say, the first words we, the first words we were taught to say were the words, Our Father. When we pray this prayer, we are back again in the far off days of childhood. We remember our fathers and mothers, some of them in glory now, who would have given their lives for our souls. And as you think of those happy days, we become children once again. And becoming children, we become fit to receive the blessing. For except we turn and become as little children, we shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. So... This form of prayer becomes a vehicle of grace, tender, sacred and universal. It lifts us nearer to God and rightly finds a place in all the public services of the sanctuary. But this prayer is much more than a form to be used. It is also a model for all our prayers. The disciples came to Jesus asking him how to teach them how to pray. This prayer is the answer to that request. Instead of giving disciples a string of rules and principles, instead of delivering a long discourse on the theory of prayer, Jesus did what was infinitely more helpful. helpful. He gave them a pattern of prayer. He taught them this exquisite prayer of six petitions and said to them, After this manner, therefore, when you pray. This is a model prayer, both as to manner and order and spirit. Firstly, it is a model as to manner. I will note here only three characteristics of the prayer. First, you'll notice its brevity. The, the prayer that teaches to, pray, teaches to pray contains only six short petitions. The measure of a prayer is not its length, but its sincerity and earnestness. One good friend reminded a minister who was accustomed, who was accustomed to take full time in his preaching, that there was all the difference in the world between the length of a sermon and the strength of a sermon. So, there is all the difference between the length of the prayer and the strength of the prayer. We are not heard for, we are not heard for how much speaking. The priests of Baal cut themselves with knives and cried from morning until dusk, Baal, hear us. The mob at Ephesus shouted out for the space of two hours, Great Diana of the Ephesians, the command is laid upon us, be not like them. We are to avoid all vain repetitions. If prayers were valued according to the length, then there would be no prayers to, complete, to compete with the Pharisee. But the publican, who could only stammer out that one heartbroken petition, God be merciful to me, a sinner went to his home justified rather than the Pharisee in spite of his long prayers. We have not yet got rid of the notion that there is merit in long prayers. We need to learn the truth Augustine wishes to enforce when he says that the much speaking is one thing and much praying is quite another. There can be much prayer in very little speech. In fact, the shortest prayers are always the most eloquent. We need to shorten prayer. Want will make prayer direct and pointed. Two of the most moving prayers I know in the whole range of the Bible literature are the prayer of the poor Canaanitish woman who had had a sick daughter. And his prayer consisted of these three simple words, Lord, help me. And the prayer of that dying thief on the cross who in the agony of mortal pain cried, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Friends, it does not require many words to pray. 
No one need restrain themselves from, from prayer because, like Moses, they are slow of tongue. You can compress a great prayer into the compass of a brief sentence. As Thomas Bilney used to say, a little prayer may bring a large answer and bring it soon. If sincerity and faith give it wings. A short word may be made long enough to spend the distance between heaven, earth and heaven if it be struck of the living heart. Secondly, notice the directness of the prayer. How pointed the petitions are. There are no wasted words. Here are this number of distinct and definite requests, each of which is stated clearly and plainly in a few simple words. There is no need for a cloud of words in prayer. There is no need of elaborate and high-flown language. There is no need to beat about the bush. Let us be more direct in our prayers. I'm afraid we've got into the habit of using a kind of conventional language in prayer as if God did not understand our common talk. The ideal prayer, however, is that what makes a request known to God with the same frankness and directness with which a child makes known his wants to his parents. Look at these petitions. Each of them is a prayer for a distinct and definite object. We want the same directness in our prayers today. As Matthew Henry quaintly puts it, we should always strike at the white. Then notice the simplicity of the prayer. This is a prayer so simple that the child can understand it. This is not a prayer reserved for the use of the learned, the cultured and the highly educated. This is a prayer everybody can understand. Wayfaring men, though fools, need not err therein. But its simplicity is not shallowness. People are apt to make mistakes. They think that profound which is simply tur turbid and muddy. They think, on the other hand, that which is transparent and clear must be shallow. But the cloudy pool is often very shallow, while those waters of crystal clearness contain depths no plummet can fathom. It is so with this prayer. It is simple, exquisitely simple, so simple that even a child can grasp its meaning. But what depths do these simple sentences hide? Have we not been learning Sunday by Sunday something of the grandeur and sweep of the prayer? We have been trying during these past Sundays to explore the length and the breadth, the height to the depth of this prayer. But have you not felt, as the preacher has felt, that after all our exploring, there are yet undiscovered regions to this prayer? There is a deep below the deep and a height beyond the height. And our hearing is not hearing, and our seeing is not sight. Truth is always a matter of idea, not of language. A man is most profound, so a man is not profound because he uses complex words. The profoundest thought can be expressed in the simplest language. Shall I tell you the profoundest truth ever uttered by mortal man? Here it is God is love. Yet the words are the simplest that the language can't afford. It is so exactly with this prayer. Beneath these simple sentences there are depths which we have which have never fathomed. That is why this prayer will never be among the childish things which we can put away. As the years go by, time will only increase our sense of its sweep and its depth and beauty. Let me pass on to say that this prayer is a model as to order. I need not dwell long, I hope, on this, for I have already drawn attention to it in the course of my exposition. But let me repeat again that this model prayer teaches us that, that in all true prayer, God's glory will occupy the first place. Before ever a word is said about personal needs, our Lord teaches his disciples to pray that God's name may, may be hallowed, that his kingdom may come, and that his will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is after this manner we are always to pray. That is the order we must observe in all praise. First things first, first God's glory, then our personal wants. This is the hardest lesson of all to learn. The great feat of life is accomplished when we have learned to prefer God's will to our own, and when we honestly seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And yet this hard lesson we all must learn if we are to find strength and comfort in prayer.
people talk about unanswered prayers, there ought to be no unanswered prayers. It is the man or woman who has learned the true secret of prayer that there are no unanswered prayers. It is the man or woman who has forgotten the true order who complains of unanswered prayers, since the man or woman who has thought more of their own personal desires than of the glory of God who complains that heaven is deaf to his cry. The man or woman who has learned to seek first the kingdom of God, who sincerely desires that God's will may be done, that person never talks about unanswered prayers. All their prayers are richly and graciously answered. They ask and receive, they seek and they find. They knock and the door is always open. If you put the emphasis in the wrong place by laying stress on your own desires, you will be troubled by unanswered prayers. But if you put God first, if you desire his will may be done, you'll never miss the blessings. But you will find in your own experience the old promise still true. If we ask according to his will, he hears us. Let me ask you to notice that this prayer is a model as to spirit. After all, the power of a prayer descends, depends not upon the words we use, but upon the spirit in which we offer it. According to your faith, it shall be unto you. Our prayers may be beautiful in their language, correct in their theology, brief, simple and direct, and yet they may rise no higher than the ceiling of the room in which they are said. Even this pearl of prayers, as said by, by some of us, may be nothing but, but a barren form. Before prayer becomes living, throbbing and vital, before it can take to itself wings, before it can reach the ear of God, we must pray in the Spirit. And the Spirit which alone gives prayer its effectiveness and power is the Spirit of childlike confidence and trust. This mortal prayer is full of that Spirit. Notice how it begins, Our Father. That implies that we come to God as his children, believe, believing he is readier to give good things to us than we are to give good things to our children. It is after that manner, in childlike faith, in God's love, that we are always to pray. The measure of our trust in God will be the measure of our power in prayer. According to our faith, it shall be done to us. Christ's prayers were prevailing prayers because he had a perfect faith. He called God Father and he honoured God's fatherhood by placing an absolute and utter trust in him. We want the Christ spirit to make our prayers effectual. It is not the words that are wrong. It is not the order that is amiss. It is a, lack, it is a faith that is lacking. If only Christ's spirit of loving confidence in God were breathed into our prayers, how irresistible they would be. The late Dr Stanford quotes these exquisite lines in which George MacDonald applies the legend of how the boy Jesus once made some clay birds fly to the prayers men offer. You might remember a few weeks ago I mentioned his famous book, At the Back of the North Wind. My prayer bird was cold, would not away, although I set it on edge of the nest. Then I bethought me of the story old, love fact or loving fable thou knowest best. How, when the children had made sparrows of clay, thou madest them birds with wings to flatter and fold. Take, Lord, my prayer in thy hand and make it pray. Our prayers are often like those clay birds. They do not rise. They are lifeless and dead. But how they would soar if only the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of childlike faith in God, were breathed into them. Our Father, the first words of the prayer, teach us the spirit in which we should pray. Is there anything we want more than faith, confidence and trust in God? If we are straightened at all, we are not straightened, not in him. We are straightened, not in him, but in ourselves. If no mighty works are being done in our midst, it is not because God's arm is shortened, it is because of our unbelief. We have not yet realised the meaning in the word, in the power of that word, Father. We have not yet realised that he loves us with an everlasting love. 
we have not yet realised that he is willing to do for us exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. So, we are hungry when there is abundance within reach. We are weak when we might be strong. We are feeble when we might be resistless. We live at a poor, dying rate when there is abundant faith to be had for the asking. What do we need more than faith? A simpler trust in the power and love of God would make us irresistible. If we had faith as a grain of mustard seed, we might say to the greatest mountain of difficulty, remove hence, and it should be gone, and nothing would be impossible unto us. This prayer is the model prayer. It is a pattern which we are to imitate. And the pattern man of prayer was Jesus himself. Prayer was his vital breath. After the labours of the day were over, Jesus was accustomed to steal away to some lonely hill where he would spend the nights in quiet, loving fellowship with God. Days of toil were followed by nights of communion. Nights of communion prepared him, prepared him for days of toil. The example of Jesus enforces the apolistic precept, pray without ceasing. And Jesus illustrates also the blessing of prayer. What great answers were given to his petitions. As he was praying at his baptism, the heavens opened. As he was praying on the mount, his expression was altered and his clothes became white and glistening. And there came to him Moses and Elijah to converse with him and speak of his departure, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. As he was praying in the garden that last night, there came an angel from heaven, strengthening him. Yes, Jesus knew the comfort, the strength and the calm that only prayer can give. We may know them too. Let us be instant in prayer and we too shall be brave and peaceful and strong. For it is true today as it was when Isaiah penned the words that they who wait upon the Lord renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles, they run and are not weary, they walk and not faint. Amen. That was the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Oh. <clears throat> anyway, we, we finish with a lovely hymn, Tell Out My Soul, The Greatness of the Lord. That's number 631. 631.